I'm Benjamin, the intrepid and self-effacing and humble participant in today's um, conversation. Alright. And I'm Jana. I don't even know how to respond to that really. <laughs> it's a very atypical introduction. <laughs> Hi Ben. How's it going? Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. What are the biggest takeaways from the largest scientific survey of Mormons and ex-Mormons ever? Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll will answer that question in our next conversation. And oh, by the way, I'm going to give away a copy of this book to one of my newsletter subscribers at the end of this video. So stay tuned for the end to find out if you're the winner. Now back to our conversation. So the last question I want you to ask you, and I, I, if, if uh, you could have an audience with the brethren, <laughs> what would you advise them based, based on the findings of your book? Well, would we presume to? Right. <laughs> um, I'm glad that I haven't <laughs> been placed in that position, and I'm being completely honest. I think that would be a lot of pressure, and it's not a culture that necessarily would want to be taking advice from a woman who is nearly half a century younger than the prophet, right? Um, it's, it's a hierarchical culture. It's a very male corporate culture. I don't think that that's going to happen. <laughs> anytime soon. Well, we but then again, I didn't think the policy would be reversed, so there you go, right? What do I know? But, but here's your chance. Let's just pretend that the brethren are here and you could, you could tell them anything. What, what would you tell them? You have to have equal representation of women. You cannot continue having meetings in which decisions are made that affect women's lives directly without a woman in the room, at least one woman in the room, and not just a little token woman who, like in the, in the leaked video that I was talking about, at the very end, like in the last two minute Hail Mary pass of the meeting, someone asks for Sister Beck's opinion. She gives it, the meeting breaks up, no one even responds to what she said. I mean, it's entire tokenism to have her there, uh, to, to ask her opinion and then totally disregard it. So yes, that's hugely important. It's important to women. Um, you know. There are a couple of different narratives that I think we need to keep in mind. The narrative that the church wants us to believe is what Gordon B. Hinckley said, which is Mormon women are happy, and they're happy with their role. Statistically, he's right, because most Mormon women who are still in the church don't seem to have a problem. Younger women are a bit different, but, but the majority of Mormon women are fairly satisfied, apparently, with their roles in the church. The other part of the story, though, the other narrative that needs to also be told is that women's roles ranked as the third most common leaving, re reason for leaving for all women. And so for some women, this was an important enough issue that it was a catalyst to their departure. And we need to keep that in mind as well. We can't just say that Mormon women are happy with the way things are, because if you weren't happy, you, you're gone. Ben? What would you say? Um, so I suppose in addition to that, which, which I agree with, um, would be that all humans, right, we're subject to our cognitive biases and the way we see the world, we tend to take our experience as the norm and project it onto everyone else's experience. And good faith people who are in leadership positions, of course, don't intend to do that, but oftentimes do it. And I'm just as guilty like everyone. That's, that's what we do, right? That's what human beings do. Um, one thing that this uh, research offers is an opportunity to hear about what the experience is like from people who don't match your own experience. And that's really hard. And I like that um, some church leaders like Patrick Mason wrote in his book, Planted. Um, he's like, I, I get it, right? Like from a leadership position, this worked for you your whole life. You've always felt happy here. Why could anyone possibly be upset? Or why would they not want to be here? What's And there's just a lack of awareness on that part, not through anyone's fault, but just simply because we all have different lived experiences. Um, could we take things from here and incorporate those kinds of messages and carefully consider them non-defensively and think, okay, my experience might not be this, but this is experience that maybe not a majority, but that a critical mass of membership are experiencing. What could we do to create spaces where they feel like they're fitting in better? Even if that means that we perhaps need to change what we emphasize or give greater room for those kinds of voices to be represented in both decision making but as well as scriptural interpretation or how we're applying the stories about uh, what it means to be a Mormon in today's world or Latter-day Saint. 
um, et cetera, <laughs> and things like that. That would be one of the, I guess, pieces of advice I could humbly and constructively offer. Well, I'm and, still a Mormon and I don't get offended about that. <laughs> well, it, and uh, in line with what you were just saying, I think when we are, when we have more diverse decision makers, we get to have that perspective in the room that we didn't have, whether it's women, whether it's people of color, whether it's millennials who are, of course, grossly underrepresented in our uh, church structure in terms of decision-making authority. And those are perspectives that we're just not hearing. And so instead of thinking of those groups as partners in a team, we see them as problems to be solved, singles as well you know, problems to be solved in the church. And so that's not a very healthy dynamic when minority perspectives are simply viewed as how do we solve this problem? Instead, it should be how do we all together, incorporating those voices, make everybody feel that they're part of this, that they're invested in this. And that's, I mean, that complements very well. There's all kinds of business research, sociological research, right, that companies that diversify their decision-making bodies tend to be more innovative, they tend to be more productive. Their stock returns are better. Right? Exactly, I mean, it's exactly. crazy. Right. <laughs> now, there's all kinds of research on this. There's, in my mind, like, why would we think that that would not also be the case in, say, religious organizations or decision-making bodies that if we want to be innovative and um, fulfilling the mission of the institution that taking pieces from all the different experiences of the people who claim it as part of their identity, the reason why we think that that would harm the institution. It just There's not a lot of social science research that backs that up. If anything, it's when leadership committees and decision-making bodies are more homogenous and focused on conformity that they tend to be less successful in the wider world. Of course, you know, that's Taking the assumption that, I mean, you know, there's there's also the perspective that, okay, well, that's why the church is different. It's not like the world. It's not, you know, there's there's all these other things. There's revelation and all this. And that's all true. And that's that's very much part of it as well. But I think just recognizing that revelation comes through human beings who have imperfect perspectives and are trying the best they can helps a lot in terms of being more humble about what we can claim to know uh, for absolute certainty and what would be the right thing to do in every situation. Great. Well, that's awesome. Well, Jana and Ben, I thank you so much for participating here on Gospel Tangents. Thank you for having yes, us. Yes, thank you so much. And Thanks. for coming to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Jana Reese and Dr. Benjamin Knoll. Jen and Ben, thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me and, uh, and finding a room in Kentucky so that we could uh, sit together and, and talk. So it was a lot of fun, and I really recommend this book. Now, one of my lucky um, sub newsletter subscribers is going to win a copy of uh, actually this book right here. And so I've got my assistant, Preston, that's going to come help us do this draw. So can you shake up? Our little cup here with everybody's name come closer so that people can see it. Okay. Shake it up really good. Okay. Okay. Oh my goodness. All right. So now let's take off the lid and then you're going to pick one of our lucky newsletter subscribers. And yeah, I'm glad you got your eyes closed. Who's it going to be? Let's see here. It is Frank McCleskey. So congratulations, Frank. Send me an email at gospeltangents at gmail.com or I will send you one and tell me where I need to ship this book. So congratulations. Now, our next piece of excitement is we have a general authority on the podcast, Elder Stephen Snow. And so let's get a little bit more acquainted with him. Uh, for me, uh, the more I learn about our history as a church, it actually strengthens my testimony. This, the more I learn, uh, the more respect I have for those that went before and the hard things they did. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, 
please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.